Okay, so this morning's a, a little bit of a this and that um, service today because there's a lot of really important things um, we wanted to do and many of you know, but some of you don't, that we started the internship program this year, 2023. We've been talking about it for a while, we've been thinking about it, yep, got a microphone over there, um, and it just and it, we just felt like this is the year to pull the trigger. So we were advertising it last year. And Samantha, this is Samantha Cregan, this is Abigail Bender. They, they, <laughs> they put their hands up for full time. Um, and then there was another person, Mackenzie uh, McComb. Uh, she was able to do three subjects in the first semester, which fitted in, knitted in with her university schedule. And it was great to have... Mackenzie involved in that, but she wasn't able to do any of the practical ministry aspects that these girls have done. So these guys have done the whole bit. And here we are in third term. They're still breathing, kicking, <laughs> uh, right enthusiastic. They're very nervous right now. Um, but um, they've been a blessing. They've been a delight to have in the office. They have been a joy to have um, serving God in the ministries at New Life in the ch with the children and the youth and um, uh, looking at, look, right from babes, right from babes. Anyway, they're going to tell you a bit more about that. So what I want to do, um, as well as the study that they've done, and this, this book, can, I don't know if you can see, if I could tip it, I would, but we're going to do a bit of a show and tell because these books represent the subjects. Of course, they've got, got the Bible. That's the biggest book, <laughs> the most important book. Um, but it reflects the study they've done. I think you'll be interested to hear what they've learned. And they're going to share something um, from one of the subjects. They, they do for a term. So they want, they're going to share individually from one of the subjects, one of the units that they did, something that really impacted them. So give them a big, big encouraging <laughs> clap. Um, uh, and this is a, this is a graded assignment. No, not kidding. <laughs> I didn't tell them that. <laughs> um, <laughs> one of their assignments. That's all right. Relax. That was just to get you um, relaxed. <laughs> okay. So we're just going to have a little. I'm just going to have a little bit of a, a quick. It's going to have to be quick, girls, because okay. yep, we've got only a short amount of time. Yep. So we'll do this quick. Um, just a few questions, first of all, before you share something that was, um, yeah, really impacted you in one of your units. So the first one is, this is for both of you, but I'll start with um, Samantha. Why did you even apply for the internship this year? Uh, so for me, I always knew that I wanted to do a gap year. Um, and it all really depended on what I wanted to do with that time, if I wanted to do uh, work or if I wanted to do extra studies or something else, like not university, but something else. Um, and one day before year 12 uh, finished, I was having a chat to Julie and she was asking me about how life was going, how school was going and what I was planning on doing afterwards. And I was like, I don't really know, but I'm planning on doing a gap year. And she was like, well, funnily enough, <laughs> We have this thing. Happy um, year for you. <laughs> and the thing that really grabbed me about the internship was the practical side. Um, I was already planning to be part of the uh, youth section of church. I was having conversations with Nathan about it. The leadership, but, yeah. Like the leadership part. But yeah. um, the practical sides of also doing the younger kids ministry on the Thursdays as well as like other ministry path, like paths that I was doing, um, really grabbed my attention and that's kind of why I applied, just okay. to do the yeah. ministry stuff. Basically. Interested. Okay, Abigail. <laughs> I, uh, when applying for the internship, I like looked at it and you were just like, internship, come apply. And I was like, <laughs> ooh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't really want to do that. And I, I like came up with excuses. I was like, I don't want to do it to feel like I have to do it. Because what if God doesn't want me to do it? What if it's not necessary to my spiritual journey? And then Julie kind of messaged me. She's like, hey, do you want to talk over the internship? And I was like, no. <laughs> and, and, and I came and eventually like a month past the due date, I was like, oh, I have time. And she was like, yeah, sure, come, come talk it over. And 
And we went and I looked at it because I was, what I was most terrified of was going through ATAR again. <laughs> I was not prepared for ATAR. These guys finished school at the end of last year. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, I was not prepared for ATAR and I wasn't prepared for this internship, which was because I was very, very mistaken in what I thought it was when I looked at all Julie showed me and I was like, oh yeah, seems legit. <laughs> and, and I was like, seems fine. Doesn't look like ATAR, good, I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> And I did it, and it was the best misunderstanding I ever had. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. That's great. Okay. Now, Samantha, I'm just going to ask you real quick. Real quick. Tell us what a typical week looks like for you. So we have about 35 hours of scheduled time. Um, I think we have a, the intern Loosely. schedule. Loosely. There's a bit of relaxed time in there, I well, there's, can say. There is, yeah, there is some chill time, but there is yeah. 35 hours yes. that we dedicate to internship. Yeah. Um, so included in this time, we have some live worship sets, uh, personal devotions. We have four classes a week. Um, so every semester. morning you do personal devotions. Yes. Abigail, please just hold up those four journals four. and just quickly tell me what, what is that? What is that? That is personal that devotions. Is, so for personal devotions, starting in the first semester, we were writing out the entirety of the Psalms. We've just finished writing out We've 150 Psalms. Uh, <laughs> that deserves a clap. <laughs> <laughs> um, every morning in the prayer room, that's where you start. Yeah, every, yeah, every morning in the prayer room. Um, and then we have four classes a week. So Mondays we don't have classes, but Tuesdays, Thursdays and Fridays we do have class. Um, first of we have two classes um, and then we also have our dedicated practical hours so the Friday nights, Thursday afternoons, Wednesday mornings. Um, so Wednesday morning we serve for childcare while the Women Wednesday is on so like the babes zero to three. Uh, then we have Thursday serving for primary school, New Life Kids and then Friday night we have the youth group serving so that's Fantastic. brief overview. Thank you, that's awesome. Each term, you, as you said, you have four subjects with different members of the pastoral team. Mm. So, Abigail, quickly give us an overview of what subjects you've studied so far. So we, have, we do have four teachers, technically five, because we have you, Wayne, uh, Nathan. Right now we're working with Chantel, but before Jason... The first semester. Before Jason took his break, we were working with Jason. Yep. And yeah. so we've had so we've had five classes yeah. technically Amazing. five teachers. You have yeah. with uh, with Wayne. We've been doing basically biblical worldview. We've been doing uh, this book First uh, term one, Michelle. Yeah. This book changed everything. And now what we, is it? we have what book? This we, one. Yeah, that book. Yes, this one yeah. that I just that put up. book. <laughs> that book changed everything. This no, or did this I, book. No, the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> And we just finished uh, Love Thy Body with yeah. Wayne as well. Oh, yeah. nice. uh, with okay. Nathan, we have been doing uh, Spiritual Disciplines and mm. the Life of David. This is our, these are our Spiritual Disciplines books. We were about to finish this one eventually. We are, we are doing this one currently. <laughs> ordering and Your Private we're World. Going to do, or, ordering Your Private World and we're going to do, what's this one called? <laughs> Celebration of discipline. Yeah. Yeah. I looked at it and I see Richard Foster. Everyone celebrates good. discipline, right? Yes. Yes, we do. Yes. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> with, um, with Jason, we were doing Old Testament survey and we just finished that before he... Uh, took a break? Took yep. his break. I keep thinking dropped out, that's not what happened. <laughs> this isn't college. This isn't What's university. This one? That's What's this our one? Space for God book. Technically, Julie. Uh, that's Julie's Julie. class, kind of. It's not really a class. It's a journal then. It's, it's a yeah. journal, yeah. It's a journal. You both Learning loved to make space for God. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's great. But it was you mainly self. It was mainly self-led, but also Julie led. Yes. Yeah. It must be finished. Yes. Speaking of Some Julie, of you we have done that book. Classes. That's yeah. uh, been Israel, basically. Okay. Israel, and uh, yeah. you also gave me Hitler's cross when you were in Israel. Yes. Uh, I haven't finished it. Yeah. Okay. But it's good. It's good. It's, it's a good really read. Good. It's a good beginning. And you did the life of David as well with yes, Nathan with in Nathan. first semester. We okay, did. fantastic. Thank you. So, Samantha, oh, and Chantel, we're oh. doing we are doing song of songs. Song of songs. <laughs> yes, that's awesome. And then Book of Daniel with you. Book yes. of Daniel, Daniel now. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. with me this semester. Yeah. So lots there, covering lots. Did you get that? <laughs> covering lots of stuff. <laughs> it's been it's been really great. Um, so, Samantha, how is the internship? benefited and or changed you? <laughs> well, uh, for me, 
it's kept me really busy and it kind of shocked me into organizing my life because if I had not organized my life, I'd probably fall apart at this point. But um, it's also allowed space in my life to reconnect to God and focus on him fully before I go into like universities or like pr- uh, more studies. And it's a great way, like it's helped me set up my adult life before I actually go and do adult life <laughs> in a way. <laughs> this it's is adult life. <laughs> Very different. Um, it's been, like, so valuable to be mentored by the pastoral team, like you and Julie, uh, not you, you and Wayne and everyone else. Um, and also, like, being around the church family um, during my ministry as well. And it's given me, like, the brain break from life to just focus again on God and to really strengthen my mm-hmm. relationship with him, which has been really nice. Awesome. Abigail? Yeah, it's been really enriching in uh, my relationship with God. I was like, well, maybe it's not necessary. It was necessary. (laughs) (laughs) It was very necessary. Uh, Same to Samantha, I am definitely learning to organize my life because I, like, looked at hard things that I had to do and I was like, oh, maybe I can get away without doing that (laughs) and I can just, like, you know, not go to university and only do what I want to do in life. And God was like, no, no. And I'm learning that... uh, God gives us hard things to do in life because he wants us to grow and mm-hmm. he didn't make life to be easy. Mm-hmm. He, he, he lived the hardest life that you could have lived, died on a cross because he thought we were worth it. And I'm sitting here going like, oh, God isn't really worth all the hard work. <laughs> when he died on a cross for me, yeah. he gave yep. so much and I'm really learning the importance of responsibility mm. and hard work yep. <laughs> because... I thought I was going to get through life easy peasy, do it my way because everyone else is wrong. <laughs> I, w- I, w- I was wrong. I was very, very wrong. And I'm very glad that I did the internship. To find out you were wrong. To find out I That's was wrong. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Okay. So um, this sounds like an obvious question after what you've just said, but would you recommend the internship? Would you recommend it? For people to consider, especially nah, no, especially <laughs> students perhaps leaving high school thinking about what am I going to do, I'm not really sure what I want to study, um, or even people in university to do what Mackenzie did part-time or more. Would you recommend it? Yeah. Um, I would 100% recommend it, just like especially for those who are coming straight out of school. Um, like for me, as I was saying before, it kind of set me up for like my young adulthood um, and also has secured me in my faith more just because I've spent this time uh, like cultivating it, I guess. And then, and even if you're not coming straight out of school, I think it's a great way to get mentorship, to get life advice um, because we're just constantly surrounded by the pastoral team and you guys love us and it's been really great to have all of that knowledge that we don't have, just have, because you guys have like lived life and we're basically practically starting. So it's great to be around that also in that loving community yeah. of the people around us. Yeah. And also like the responsibilities of like, um, d- like if you're doing it full time, like the doing the, uh, what's it called? The ministry aspects has been really good to like cultivate my sense of responsibility just because there's so much opportunity now that I didn't have like six months ago, which has been really good. Fantastic. Abigail? Yes, I I, I would recommend it for sure. Uh, I only have my own experience to speak off of. So if you're just like me, do it. (laughs) If if you struggle with procrastination uh, and if you've done ATAR on a whim and never want to go near an assignment again, do it. Come do the internship. Uh, (laughs) Because... Because you'll get assignments. Doing, doing the internship. <laughs> I'm just going to say, uh, I'm actually like learning. I'm unlearning to procrastinate, which is a miracle for me. <laughs> because I, like, I really, really changed my perspective is what this year has done. Um, rather than, it's not just going work, 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 and I'll learn to work. No, it's these people who are mentoring you, pastoring you. And I've learned that I can't get through life without putting effort into things I don't want to do. And I've also realized that that's not unfair. <laughs> because I was like, oh, I could only have to do it. No, life wasn't tailored to me. Yeah. Oh, good. That's great. Write that down. <laughs> okay. 
Yeah, prophesying yeah. now, Abigail. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Um, and it's 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 an amazing environment. We we live at the prayer room. We, we, li- we live it, it, it is our it is, home. It is our house. <laughs> <laughs> Wayne, Wayne tells them disagree. it's oh, not Wayne, their house. Wayne <laughs> 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 Often. <laughs> Often, yes. <laughs> okay. All right. It's great. So, um, girls, look, I just want to say, again, how much we've loved it. And I, you know, from the start of the year, praying with you guys in the prayer room to now praying with these guys in the prayer room, it's really been such a blessing. And we were in the prayer room. They're praying scriptures, praying from scriptures. And we were in the prayer room this week. And um, one of these interns started praying and they kept praying and they kept praying, and they kept praying, and then they were crying as they were praying, and I was like, Lord Jesus, thank you. This is awesome. <laughs> uh, yep, that's right. <laughs> so it's just been a blessing. It's just been a blessing, you guys. Yeah, we, we're we going to miss you. Do you want to do internship next year? <laughs> yes. 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 <laughs> again. Okay, again. Again. We'll do it again. <laughs> we'll find different subjects for you. Mm. Um, so it's been fantastic. Now, Samantha, up you get, because you're going to give us, um, she's just going to share with us something short um, from her it. Old Testament survey subject, a little bit of what she's learned and why it's been so great. Off you go. Okay, so one class we had during the first semester was our Old Testament survey with Jason. And the idea was to gain a basic understanding of the Old Testament. And honestly, I was dreading this class as soon as I heard about it. Because even though for me, spending most of my life in New Life, where we place such a high importance on the Old Testament, I had convinced myself that it was too hard to understand, that I'd probably never understand it, and that I didn't have to read it in my personal time if we're doing it in church. But then this class, it shattered all my presuppositions, and it quickly became one of my favorite classes. I'm so sorry to everyone else. Your classes are amazing, but it did, it was my favorite because for me, gaining a basic understanding of the Old Testament has made me fall in love with it. I generally enjoy opening to the Old Testament now where before I would stay away far, as far away as possible. So jumping straight in, I want to briefly talk about the order or organizations of the books in the Old Testament. So one thing I found really interesting and extremely helpful to understand was that English Old Testament and Hebrew Old Testament are actually organized differently. So they're both organized in three separate sections. So English is history, poetry, and prophecy, and Hebrew is the law or Torah, the prophets, and the writings. And the English Old Testament, it's mostly organized in the size order of the books, rather than the chronological order of them, where the Hebrew is organized chronologically, which I don't understand. Why did we not put it in chronological order? Because that would make it so much easier to read, but no, we decided not to. Um, But now, through this class, I understand the context and sort of where the books sit on a timeline, so I can read it through the correct lens, which has been so helpful. So now, the Old Testament covers over 2,000 years of time before Christ, and it's a crazy big story, and it can be hard to wrap your head around, So the way that we interns try to help ourselves to understand it was by creating a visual representation or a timeline, you could say. Now, you guys probably can't read all the words, and that's okay. So I'm going to break it down, okay? (laughs) So first we have the election. See if we can change slides. Um, So the beginning of the Old Testament story begins with Genesis, which can be split into two parts. The prehistoric section of Genesis, which is chapters 1 to 11, recounts the creation, fall, flood, and the Tower of Babel. And then the election election section uh, recounts the stories of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. And we name this section of the timeline election because it's what happened with Abraham. God chose or elected Abraham, regardless of his sinful human nature, to be the father of his holy and set-apart people. This period ends when Moses is called to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. So next we enter into Exodus period, as the book of Exodus says, uh, is titled. The Israelites uh, are taken out, of the, uh, taken out of Egypt into the wilderness by Moses. And during this time, while in the wilderness, Moses writes the first five books of the Bible, or the Torah, as the Israelites would refer to it. And the Torah consists of all the laws and commandments that God gave the Israelites to live by, but also introducing his festivals and traditions that he wanted his people to partake in. 
So included in this time period, we also have prophets, priests, and judges emerging as leaders in the sense that they are the voice of God. And, but the people were still sinful, and it said that every man did what was right in his own eyes, and they disobeyed God. So this period ends when they ask the judge Samuel, the Israelites ask Samuel, to choose a king for them, to be like their surrounding nations, falling deeper in their disobedience. So next we enter the empire slide, when, or the emp- empire period, where Saul starts leading. And then we, this time extends past through King David and King Solomon and all the other kings after. So one thing I want to touch on quickly is the divided kingdom. This is something that really confused me when I was trying to understand the Old Testament for myself. So I'm going to try and briefly explain it. So there's these two guys. There's Rehoboam and Jeroboam. They're very similar names, which is sort of annoying. But Rehoboam is Solomon's son, and Jeroboam was an advisor to Solomon. So while Solomon was still alive, there's a prophet who came to him and told him that 10 of the tribes in his kingdom would be given to uh, Rehoboam rather than to his son Jeroboam. No, be given to Jeroboam instead of Rehoboam. And when Solomon died, Jeroboam told the new king not to be like his father before him and to take it easy on the people. But Rehoboam was a foolish man and he told the people that he would increase the already heavy yoke that his father had issued on them. So the northern tribes rebelled against him, and Jeroboam was made king over the ten of them, and this is what we now call Israel. And then Rehoboam was king over the two tribes in the south that we now call Judah. So most of Israel, um, the Israelite kings, they were evil, and they disregarded God's voice and rule. And there was a few kings in Judah who tried to do the will of God, but Ultimately, each one failed in their own right, and the people fell more and more into their disobedience and disregard for God, which leads to the last section. So the last section is the period that we've called exiles. This is where most of the prophetic books lie. So Israel and Judah were both exiled for their disobedience against God. The whole of Israel went first. They went in to Assyria in about 722 B.C., And then Judah went in three waves to Babylon, beginning in 586 BC. Now, after Israel was exiled, they fell into the patterns of the people that exiled them. They were marrying people from different nations. They were uh, following other gods. And and so they were scattered throughout the known world. And they haven't actually fully returned to their homeland. And though even Judah was exiled, they kept relatively to themselves. They kept their own traditions. They married their own women and... They uh, was completely set apart from the Babylonians that were exiled them. So, and it was prophesied before the um, before Judah went into exile that they would return 80 years later, and which they did. And then they rebuilt the temple in 516 BC. So when they return, the monarchy has ceased, and the priests and prophets become the voice of God's law. And during this time, following God became more of a religious practice, being hyper-focused on all the rules and not trying to break any of them and not trying to fail, rather than a heart connection or devotion to God. And this was the condition of the people when Jesus entered the scene after the 400-year gap, so in the timeline. And with all these laws and these rules, people still failed to reach the standard God needed to restore his fellowship to his people. And this brings me to my last point. I've just dumped a whole bunch of information on you guys, and there is so much more I could have gone into, but we would be here for weeks. (laughs) So the thing I want to leave you guys with is this. Throughout the Old Testament, we see these different type of leadership functions. We see patriarchs, prophets, kings, and the priests. But the thing about this is that all the leaders in these positions, they were flawed, and each individual brought their own sinful natures and messes to the task. God knew that his people needed a leader who encompassed the function of patriarch, prophet, king, and priest all in one, as well as having no flaw in himself. And no one in the Old Testament story would have been able to fulfill this need. The man needed was Jesus, as we know now. God uses the Old Testament story to show us that it could not be done by any mere man, to show us that the only man worthy of leading his people and bringing about his kingdom would be his son. The Old Testament story ultimately points to Jesus and what he would do on the cross. And without it, there's such a massive part of the awesomeness and amazingness of the reality of Jesus that we miss out on. Learning the prophecies in the Old Testament that point to Jesus makes the fulfillment in them of them in the New Testament so much richer. Knowing the promises God has made throughout the Old Testament and seeing that Jesus secures them in their fulfillment through the New Testament gives me a hope that was so much sweeter than the one I had before. 
and realizing the true nature of God is constant through Old and New Testament, it has deepened my faith more than I would have ever imagined before this class. And I hope that me sharing today, it will give you this desire to study the Old Testament for yourself also, to challenge the presuppositions, the assumptions you have about it, that it's too hard, that it's too confusing, because it strengthens and it enriches the New Testament. I hope that you guys will seek out the big picture of the Bible that God wants you to see, because there's always more we can learn, and there's so much more that God wants to show us. We just have to be willing to ask. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Samantha. Well done. And Abigail, so you have decided um, <clears throat> that you're going to share from the class with Wayne. So that's a biblical worldview. And you've just finished studying this book. Very interesting. Thanks. Yes. Tell us what you've enjoyed and why it's so good. Yes. I will. <laughs> All right. Give me a second. Why did I bring the book? The first thing I thought uh, looking at this book, Love Thy Body, I read the title and I was like, this is a book about uh, body positivity. And technically, yes, yes, about body positivity. It is not about this secular idea, this sort of not Christian, when I say secular, I mean not Christian, not Christian idea that uh, like, oh, your appearance, love your appearance, love your body shape. That's not what this book is about. <laughs> this book is about knowing and respecting your body as a part of your God-given identity. Mm. It really goes into the difference in the secular and biblical worldviews. That's why this is called Biblical Worldview. Mm -hmm. how, they how they view the body. And highlighting this book highlights that the biblical worldview actually holds a much higher view, like a good view, of the body than the secular worldview. Uh, so... I'm just going to go into the two worldviews. I think the defining difference between these worldviews is that the secular worldview is based on the belief that there is no God, obviously. And the way that that affects the body is that it denies the idea of creation, of design, saying that our physical body has no moral significance. Our lawmaker is our mind, our thoughts, our feelings, this autonomous choosing self. That is basically saying, creating the split between the person and the body that the secular worldview is kind of pushing onto modern Western culture. Uh, however, the biblical worldview obviously is based on the fact that we have a creator, one creator, our almighty God, him himself. Uh, where am I? <laughs> and because there is a creator, we have been created we are given purpose, we are given design, intention, and we are called to respect our bodies that God has created for us, that are a part of us. Uh, just as a disclaimer, I think I should let you know this is a hard book to read. Uh, we're going to going into topics such as abortion, sex, homo 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 <laughs> homosexuality, and more, and I'm going to be getting into that now. Uh, we're going to start with the difference in the secular and biblical worldview on abort abortion and euthanasia. Murder. Let's start. Uh, the secular idea, this split between body and person, affects abortion and euthanasia by creating a sort of justification of murder, saying that a human is not worthy of life unless they are able to display this sort of idea of personhood. You can be human and not be worthy of life. You need to show signs that you're able to choose, able to feel. And the thing is, no one can decide on when this sort of personhood starts, which is why there's such a huge argument around abortion. Being human is not enough to have the right to life. But a much it's, it's a very unstable sort of grounds for the right to life. A much more stable alternative is the biblical worldview that says that humans are created in the image of God and that gives them inherent dignity. And no matter whether or not you can tell that they're able to choose or you can tell that they're able to feel, no matter what you see on the outside, the fact that they are a human being 
is enough to give them the right to life. It doesn't matter how much of a person they are. It's a much higher view of the physical human body as created by God. Uh, now I want to go into another example of how the body person split affects it affects the popularity of homosexuality and transgenderism. I didn't put them on the same slide, but they are one after the other, so it's okay. <laughs> now, the split between body and person, it affects these topics by saying that our emotions do not match our biological body. Our mind doesn't match the body. You can be sort of this idea that you are put into the wrong body which is funny because they deny the existence of a creator. You, the secular culture denies the existence of a creator, but then I was put in the wrong body. Basically, uh, this idea that the person can be entirely different from the body, trapped in the body, the LGBTQI a million letters movement says, that sort of says that you are meant to be in disharmony with your body. And by bowing to the will of your feelings, your emotions, you are accepting your true, authentic self. That is who you are. Your identity is in your emotions, your feelings. And your feelings change. Which, so that's, very, that's very unstable grounds for your gender identity. A much more stable alternative, again, is the biblical worldview, where your, your gender identity is rooted in your sex how you were born, your biological sex, that doesn't change. It doesn't change. Uh, it's obvious that biologically, male and female bodies, they complement each other. Uh, and that comes from the design, the intent of God, the creator. He designed us to partner with people of the opposite sex, no matter what your feelings are, because due to the fall, we are going to have feelings that do not match our bodies, but no matter what they are, he created us to be most fulfilled by someone of the opposite sex. He created us to be in unity with our bodies. It's a much higher view of the body by saying that our bodies are precious and our bodies deserve to be respected by the way we use them. Uh, now I'm going to go into, we also use our bodies in a hookup culture, basically. There is a, the secular split between body and person affects the idea of sex with the introduction of hookup culture. And the secular narrative says that you can separate your physical relationship from your emotional relationship. In fact, young people are encouraged to have as little emotional attachment as possible when engaging in casual sex. The secular worldview says that the action of sex has no moral significance. Our actions have no meaning. That our bodies don't mean anything. Uh, so, have you heard the phrase, have, has anyone said to you, actions speak louder than words? Or I'll provide a more biblical alternative, James 2, verse 14 to 26. I didn't put it on the slide, don't worry. Faith without good works is dead. You don't have to read the whole thing. Faith without good works is dead. You have to show with your actions that you have faith. The biblical worldview says that our actions do have meaning. God created body language for a reason. And as one of the most intimate forms of unity, sex was made to unite us, not only on the physical level, but on all aspects of our life, emotional, spiritual, personal. Sex is an act of commitment. I want to be with you forever and ever and ever and ever until we die. When we have a physical sexual relationship without the emotional relationship, we are going against our body. We are lying we are breaking the promise that we are making with our body. The biblical worldview shows that we actually have a much higher view of the body. We are avoiding heartbreak against our own body, against the promises we make with our body. Uh, I'm also going to go into my last topic, family. This is our last chapter, a very recent, fresh on the mind. We're going to see how this body-person split is affecting the concept of families basically saying that biology is irrelevant. That doesn't make a family. If your kid came from you and your husband slash wife, your spouse, if your kid came, if, is a part of you, has your guys' DNA, doesn't matter. What matters is whether you say that they're your child 
and you make what I'm going to go into here a contract that says, yep, I am going to care for this kid. Uh, I'm going to go into this difference between contracts and covenants. Contracts are a very uh, secular idea. Covenants are a more biblical idea. I don't think I've seen anyone that wasn't a Bible person talk about covenants. A contract is this sort of trade to meet one another's needs. Uh, The terms of the contract are based on the two people or more people who make the contract, the terms of the contract, and if those terms are broken, the contract ends. And that is how secular culture is starting to view childhood itself, that you make a contract with your kid, with the other person, to care for the kid until this kid is grown up and the contract ends, or until the kid does something wrong, breaks your terms of the contract, contract ends. The covenant, however, is a promise. And the covenant, let's say, of childhood, of childbearing, that is a promise you make from the moment of conception. The moment that you're about to have that kid, that you have sex, and the kid comes out of that, that is your covenant, that is your promise. It is a physical, bodily promise. Uh, Also, so this is a promise. The terms of the covenant are pre-existent. God made them, we didn't. They are biological terms, they're natural terms that say how we are to treat the child and how the child is to treat us. You see it in the Bible, honor your father and mother. Parents don't exasperate your children. These are the innate laws that are integrated into biology. And last of all, covenant lasts forever. You may not have the kid in your house for all of your life, but you are called to take and guide your kid, your child through life, all of life, forever. And it is also a covenant that God gave us when he said, you are my children and he is going to prepare, provide for us forever. We are going to be his children forever. Now, the way that secular culture is viewing it with childhood as a covenant is making it so that marriage, children, families are sort of irrelevant. And the reason that we have these covenants is that people need support from the outer community. But if families aren't recognized, if biological families aren't recognized unless they make the contract, they aren't going to be legible as a sort of, as, as requiring the aid that they need from outside sources, from the community. It is very devaluing of biological families, whereas you can see in the biblical worldview, it is actually a much higher view of the body. I'm going to wrap it up. I think a good way to view the way that this, the kind of, what this book is trying to say. Have you ever heard the term, uh, your body is a temple, my body is a temple? I, you can change the slide. I always kind of looked at it as, uh, don't get tattoos, don't get piercings. (laughs) No tattoos, my body's a temple. Temples. Uh, I always thought, okay, that's kind of stupid. Because people, I see Christians with tattoos, I see Christian with piercings. Tattoos are another whole nother That's not this conversation for today. (laughs) What we're talking about, we're going to go into where where this phrase came from. This book is basically where this phrase came from. It's misused as a sort of secular self-care mantra. My body's a temple, I've got to take care of it. No, yes, no. (laughs) Uh, Next slide. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19 to 20 is where this kind of originates from. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God. You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price. So you must honor God with your body. Our bodies are God-given, part of our identity. We are called to respect our bodies, respect God with our bodies. And that is what this book is about. Thanks, Abigail. We really needed another table with 60 for sale at the end, right? <laughs> um, so, look, we've run out of time, but you guys did really well. They were, they were given 10 minutes each. They had to squish everything in and um, present something of what they've learned. Just, just a tiny bit of what they've learned and been learning this year in the internship. And you've, you've done well. You've done well. Give them another, both of them a big, huge clap. <laughs> 
So I just wanted to close by saying that, uh, well, there's a QR code coming up on the screen. There it is. Feel free. That'll take you straight to our website where you can sign up for the next internship, which is 2024. Um, and that's even anyone who's watching on the uh, web stream today. Go and check that out. Go and check out our website because we would love to see the internship continue next year, but obviously it needs interns. Uh, um, but if you know someone, maybe they're finishing school this year and they're not sure what to do and they just feel like, you know what, a, a year going deeper in the Word of God and understanding my identity as a Christ follower, that's powerful. You might be studying, you might be working, you know, um, and you're in that 18 to sort of 27 year age bracket. We would love you to express interest, okay? Um, because we're just passionate about the young generation getting rooted and grounded in the Word of God and in their identity, becoming bold and confident and going out into whatever God has for you, whatever, you know, you're studying to be or become or what you think, being someone who knows who they are in Christ will set you up for life. Amen? It really will. So thanks, everyone, for your patience. And it's been a great morning. It's been a whole mishmash of stuff. But we just recommend, I commend these girls to you. You're going to see them in the future. They're going somewhere, right? You're going to see them. And uh, serving God in places that they never would have expected. It's been a year where God's been able to just come alongside them and begin to shape their future. So thanks, girls. Thank you, New Life. Thank you for the way that you support the next generation. And truly, that's so much of what our harvest offering is about. God bless you and keep you and keep on loving God, pursuing him. If we could leave you with, you know, if that was the only thing that Wayne and I could leave you with, New Life, um, it would be that. Love God. Get to know him. Get to know him. He's, he's wonderful, he's awesome, he's beyond our comprehension. Amen.